In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> O Christ, the true light, who enlightenest and sanctifiest every man that cometh into the world. Let the light of thy countenance be signed upon us, that in it we may behold the unapproachable light, and guide our steps in the performance of thy commandments, through the intercessions of thy most pure Mother, and of all thy saints. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I would like to thank the faculty of the Holy Seminary of St. Photius for giving me the opportunity to come and speak about a topic which may seem obscure to many people, but which in fact has a great deal of relevance for the life of every Orthodox Christian, and in fact every single person on the planet, because we are all affected by what is the title of this lecture, The Moral Consequences of Nominalism. Now, for many people, the act, even the word nominalism may be unfamiliar. It is a technical philosophical term, and it refers to a specific philosophical idea, or we could say a school of philosophy regarding a particular philosophical concept. So, many people might be wondering, what does an abstract philosophical concept, a remote philosophical idea that the average person has no idea about, <clears throat> what does it have to do with our everyday lives? In fact, every part of our everyday lives beyond the pure animal instinct is dictated and informed by philosophical ideas. We could extend that to say theological ideas. The two are very closely related. So, if we refer to animal instinct, we refer to things like eating, sleeping, reproducing. These are things that all animals perform, basic animal functions. They don't require any thinking, they don't require any reasoning. They belong to the world of animals, of which, in which we participate insofar as we are bodily material creatures. However, we, human beings, also possess an immortal soul and a reasoning mind and intellect. As a result, our interactions both with each other and with the world, and most importantly with God, are much more complex. And the ideas that dictate our behavior, which influence our behavior, which cause us to choose one course of action as opposed to another course of action, all originate in philosophy. So philosophy, even though it might seem like a very distant and remote subject, which has nothing to do with anybody, in fact, has everything to do with everybody. So <clears throat> if we take philosophers throughout the course of history, the, the abstract thinker par excellence, the uh, the philosopher up in their ivory towers thinking up ideas and then we wonder what, what does that have to do with me on the street? What does it have to do with me talking to you? Well, in fact, all of culture, <clears throat> which are different ways that humans symbolize ideas through actions, through art, through speech, through literature, our laws, our morality, all our behaviors, in fact, the behaviors of entire civilizations, all of these are influenced by philosophy. That means that nominalism, being a particular philosophical idea, is going to influence, either for good or for ill, the fate of civilizations and the actions of individual people. So, we want to understand what is nominalism. We have to understand what is nominalism in order to explain what its effects are going to be. <clears throat> what is it? What part of philosophy does it occupy? How did it arise? And what are the competing philosophical views on the subject? Now, philosophy can be divided into a number of different categories, or we could call them branches of philosophy. We have, for example, logic, which is the study of reason. What is human reasoning and how do we do it? We have also physics or cosmology, <clears throat> which is the study of 
the physical world, the universe in which we find ourselves in, specifically with, with, uh, in relation to questions of space and time and uh, the ultimate questions about the physical universe, there's also epistemology. Epistemology is the study of knowledge. What is knowledge? And what can we know? And what can't we know? One of the most important aspects or branches of philosophy is metaphysics. Metaphysics is the study of being itself. It is the broadest philosophical category. Each specific branch of philosophy deals with a particular concept or a particular item, whereas metaphysics deals with being all of reality taken together. So it is the most universal of all human studies. So therefore, one of the primary studies or one of the primary focuses of, of metaphysics has to be the idea of universals themselves. What are universals? Or rather, <clears throat> to what extent do classes or groups of things exist? And to what extent do only individual objects exist? And so this is the focus of our, of our question, of, of, of our talk today. The difference between universals, or groups of things existing, and particulars existing. Now, all of our language and all of our thought as, as human beings is predicated on the idea that groups of objects exist, as well as individual particular objects. So, for example... Here's my hand, right? On my hand, I have five fingers. One, two, three, four, five. And we say this is a finger, and 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 this is a finger. <clears throat> we, as human beings, all human beings, as uh, we grow up, we learn to recognize and to identify the fingers of, the, of our hand all under the group, under the category of fingers even though they're actually different from one from another. This is my pinky finger, this is my ring finger. We have different fingers, we even have different names for each, each of the fingers, and yet all of them are fingers. So the question is, do only these fingers exist? Or is there a broader category of fingers which exists in simply our minds? Or does it exist in some sense outside of our minds? This is the question of universals. And of, this applies not just to fingers, it can apply to, to chairs, it can, it can apply to human beings, it can apply to somewhat more abstract ideas such as good acts or bad acts or virtues or vices. In fact, almost every human concept, almost every aspect of human experience in human life can fall under the category of universals versus particulars. We have both of them. For example, to take a more abstract idea, we, have, we see a person doing a good act, an act of kindness. And we say, that was a good thing for him to do. And then we see another person doing a good act. We say, that was a good thing for him to do. And then we say another person doing another good, another good act. And from all of these good acts, we conclude that there's such a thing as goodness itself. And that all of these individual acts that a person is doing, all are part of the broader idea of goodness, which is a universal. But the, the question here, the crux of the matter is, do these broad classes of things really exist? Or are they only in our minds? Are they just a convenient way of thinking about reality, but not really true? Are they just a linguistic convention? Are they a psychological habit? Are they a kind of group fantasy of the human race? This is the question of universals. So in order to answer this, this question, Let's take a look at history and what are 
the main philosophical ideas that philosophers have thought of throughout the course of history in order to answer the question. So the first philosopher to take a view, to formulate a coherent view on universals was the ancient Greek philosopher Plato, who lived in the 4th century BC. So many people consider Plato to be the greatest philosopher, or at least one of the greatest philosophers, and his big idea, the central part of his whole philosophy, was based on universals. And he had what's called a realist view of universals. He believed that universals really exist, and they exist in a very important and even concrete way. He developed a whole system of this, which is named after him. It's called Platonism. And it exists even to this day, uh, perhaps in a slightly modified form, because there have been many developments in history over the past 2,300 years, but nevertheless recognizable enough so that we can call it by the same name of Platonism. So Platonism is, in fact, the most extreme form of realism, the idea that universals actually exist, that they're real. So behind, for Plato, behind all of the multiple particulars, the individuals that exist, there is the broader concept which includes or comprehends all of the specific in instances. And he claims that not only do the universals exist just like the individuals exist, so not only does the concept of, of fingers or chairs or whatever exist just as my individual fingers exist, but that they are in fact even more real than the particulars. The universals are more real than the particulars according to Plato. Moreover, he said that true knowledge could only be about universals because the universal doesn't change. So if I have this finger and if I have this finger and this finger, they're all a little bit different. But the idea of finger is a permanent, a solid idea that doesn't change it's not in this fluctuating world of matter. It's somewhere out there in a timeless, a spaceless, an immaterial realm. And according to Plato, about, about particulars or individuals, we can only have opinions because our senses are unreliable, our eyes, our ears, our sense of touch, our sense of smell, all of these can trick us. And in fact, we notice that in, in our everyday life that we often misperceive things so he said that about particulars, we can only have um, opinion. We can't have knowledge. So universals exist outside of space and time. They're immaterial. The universal is not this finger, this finger, which material. It's the idea. Now, how is it that they exist outside of space and time? Well, let's say... I want to order a chair through through Amazon or, or through a warehouse. Okay, so I'm going to get on the phone and I'm going to call the the company. <clears throat> I'm going to say I would like such and such a chair. And the person who's on the other side, he might be in in some other state. He might be in Illinois or in Texas. When I say I want a chair. He, even though he's in a different, a completely different place, he understands that I want a chair. We both have the same idea, even though we're in completely different places. So the idea transcends space. It also transcends time, because if I tell him today that I want a chair, then tomorrow I call back again and I ask, what, what is the price of the chair? we both understand perfectly that we're still talking about the same chair, even though that chair was yesterday and this chair is today. Two different points in time. So the universal transcends both space and time. So Plato called these universals, he called them forms or ideas. Idea comes from the, the Greek word, idea, and form comes from the Latin word forma, which means the exact same thing. So we can refer to them either as ideas or, or as forms. Either way, they are universals. And for Plato, they had a religious significance. So 
he thought to himself, there's these things that exist out there. They're immaterial. They're beyond space and time. They're transcendent. They must be divine. And he thought that if we contemplate the universals in and of themselves, that must be a way of partaking, of participating in the divine. And so he said, well, there's different types of universals of different ideas, and some of them are higher and some are lower. So this must correspond to different, uh, different levels of religious experience. So thinking about fingers, the universals of fingers or of chairs or whatever, this, that's one level. But if we're going to talk about higher things, more noble things, like goodness, like truth, like beauty, these are supreme ideas, and these are what are called the transcendentals. These are ideas that are so high, so lofty, that when we think of them all together as one, and for Plato, oneness is the, the ultimate form, the ultimate universal, that this is essentially God. So this is the purpose of human life for, for Plato. And this is where, where philosophy flows into theology. Because for, for Plato, philosophy and theology are basically the same thing. Well, so we can see that, that the idea of realism, the idea of, of um, universals being real, has, can have a religious significance. And that's going to be important for the whole history of the, the question of universals. Now, let's go to the other extreme. Let's go to nominalism, which is the topic of our, of our talk today. Nominalism is the exact opposite of Platonism. Nominalism says that universals don't exist at all. There's nothing beyond space. There's nothing beyond time. There's nothing that's immaterial. There only exist concrete objects that we can perceive with our senses. Now, nominalism in the form that we know it today, in the form that it's used today by, by philosophers, was basically invented, or at least the, the concept was coherently formulated by a 14th century philosopher named William of Ockham. He was a Franciscan monk in the Roman Catholic Church. And he... He pointed out that there's some problems with, with universals, with the whole idea of universals. He said, well, how are we going to know what a universal is? How are we going to define a universal? We could, he, we could say that the definitions of universals are they're fu fuzzy around the edges. So, for example, we're talking about fingers, right? Well, we agree that, that um, the index finger and the middle finger and the ring finger and the pinky finger and the thumb are all fingers, right? Well, what about those things that are on our feet? What about our toes? Are toes fingers too? And this becomes a question of language. Because in some languages, our toes are actually referred to fingers of the feet. In Spanish we say, los dedos, los dedos del pie. So, are toes fingers? Or are they not fingers? So then the whole concept of the universal starts getting fuzzy and it starts it starts to break down. And so this was pointed out by William Ock of Ockham and other other nominalists. And moreover, they said, well, we can't experience universals directly. We we don't see them, we can't hear them, we can't perceive them with our senses in any way. They must only exist in the mind. They must be a purely mental concept. Or rather, they are a convenient mental construct, which have no more value and no more reality than what you yourself assign to it, or what society collectively decides to give to it. Now, some of you might be realizing now that this could lead to some problems, to some moral problems, and God willing, that's what we'll get into uh, in our lecture tomorrow. So, according to nominalism, there only exist concrete, specific 
particular things. So these are our two extremes. We have nominalism, there are only concrete specific things, and realism in its most ex extreme form called Platonism, that there actually exists these universal ideas that are outside of space and time. So then other philosophers started to think, well, isn't there some sort of third view? Isn't there something in between these two extremes? And in fact, uh, some very important philosophers came up with a third view, which is conveniently called moderate realism. And this idea was actually first introduced by Aristotle. Now, Aristotle was the most outstanding student of Plato. He studied for some 20 years at Plato's Academy in Athens, and then he went off and he founded his own school, in which he disagreed in certain points with his master. And um, later on, the idea of um, of moderate realism was extended or maybe put into a more a more complete a more coherent form by a distant pupil of Aristotle which was Thomas Aquinas so Thomas Aquinas is a saint of the Roman Catholic Church he was a Dominican monk he lived in the 13th century and according to this idea of moderate realism which was begun by by Aristotle and put into a coherent form by Thomas Aquinas. It says that re universals actually do exist, but not in such a, um, a concrete or bold way as, as Plato said. He said. They said that universals exist in three senses or in three ways. First of all, they exist in the mind of God. So for, for Plato... God, conceived as a, as a personal God, the way we understand him in Christianity, it wasn't a really important idea. The important idea for, for Plato was, was these abstract forms. So for, for Plato, God is a very abstract and impersonal idea. For us, of course, as Christians, we believe that God is, is a personal God, or, uh, or at the very least, we believe that he has a, a personal aspect to him, even if we might not be able to understand whatever is, is beyond um, the ability of the human mind to grasp, because, of course, we believe that God is incomprehensible, that God is a mystery. So, they said that the, the universals exist in the mind of God. They're ideas of God, not separate entities in and of themselves, not, um, not some sort of heavenly world of a million or a billion different different ideas or forms, but rather all of them are part of God's mind. Now, they also said that universals exist within our own minds. Of course, that's what the nominalists say, right? The nominalists say that, that, uh, that universals only exist in our mind. Well, the moderate realists say that, yes, they exist in our own mind, but they exist also in the mind of God, and then here's the third part, which is that they exist inside the objects or the actions themselves. So it's an attempt to reconcile the two, the two extremes. Now, what happened? What happened historically here? Historically, the moderate realist, realists were never able to persuade the, the, the nominalists of what they mean by objects existing or by universals existing inside the object. Are they simply stating that the object exists? Well, everybody agrees that the object exists. Almost everybody. Um, and they couldn't persuade them of how do we match the definitions of a, um, of a universal onto what we perceive, because there's always some sort of difference between what we perceive and the universal as, as it's... Um, as it is supposed to be in its broad reality. So what was the result of this? Everybody, almost everybody, ex rejected Platonism. They said that's just too extreme, and moreover, it contradicts Christianity. Then you had in the Middle Ages 
particularly in Western Europe, this war between the moderate realists and the nominalists. And they went back and forth for a few centuries. The Roman Catholic Church actually refused to take a position on, on it, so most of the most of the people who were arguing were actually all Roman Catholic theolo- theologians. And finally, the idea of nominalism started to prevail over the idea of moderate realism, with the result that moderat- that nominalism became the dominant philosophical idea on the question of universals all the way throughout early modern history and up to the present time. And so the, the modern philosophical world is dominated by nominalism. And virtually all modern philosophies, whatever you want to, to call them, whether it's, um, whether it's Marxism or whether it's feminism or whether it's post-Marxism or any one that you want to, any modern philosophy that you want to think of, whether it's Hume or Kant or um, any of the major philosophers of the post-medieval era, they all take as their starting point nominalism, the idea that only concrete objects exist. And so that's going to have a huge effect on how they develop the rest of their philosophy. Since they're taking this as a as a given, it means that, that it's going to affect or rather, in fact, all of their philosophy. So, let's um, let's explore a few definitions so that we can understand these concepts a little bit better. We're going to put them on the screen. So, the first one we have is definition itself. What is definition? In order to come up with an idea of a universal, we have to define what each universal is. So, a definition is a kind of description of something. It's meant to be a description which describes the thing in such a way so that it neither leaves out any property of the thing, nor is it so broad that it would accidentally include other things that we don't mean to be inside whatever that is that we are defining. So definitions are very tricky, and of course this is one of the main points where nominalists attack realists, because it's it's very hard to get a perfect definition. You're almost always going to err in one side, in one direction or the other. Either you're going to make your definition too broad, and so if we try to define a finger, we might accidentally include toes, or we might say that toes really are type, a type of finger, or we might not know what the difference between a finger and a hand is, or we might define the thing in such a restricted way that it doesn't include everything that should be included in it, that that we think it should be included in it. So we might define a finger in such a way that it excludes the thumb. And then thumbs are no longer fingers. And if we are realists, well, that creates a problem because if our definitions and our ideas correspond to actual realities, We've changed reality by removing thumb from the definition of finger. So this becomes very, very, very complicated. And it's important for, um, for our understanding of universals to get our definitions right. Now, when we talk about specific things and when we want to turn and direct them into universals, we introduce another idea, which is called essence. So the essence is what is the thing in and of itself. The philosophers distinguish between essence and or substance. Um, essence and substance are two words that are often used synonymously. And accidents. So essence or substance is what a thing must have in order to be itself. 
or as accidents are things that could be or, or don't have to be. For example, if we're talking about human beings, if we're trying to define a human being, we have to include that he's material. We have to include that he has a body because all human beings have, have bodies. We have to include rationality because this is part of being a human human being. We include mortality because all human beings die. This would give us our definition, uh, or rather Aristotle's definition of, of man as a rational, mortal animal. But we don't have to include blue eyes, because not all humans have blue eyes, and if you have brown eyes, you're still a human being. So something like blue eyes, or the color of your skin, or the shape of your nose, these are all accidents, as opposed to essence. Now, often we introduce another word, which is nature. Now, nature has many different different meanings. In the Orthodox Church, when we talk about nature, we usually mean it as something like a synonym for, for essence. We also have another word, which is frequently used in the Orthodox Church. This is hypostasis. So, Hypostasis is almost the opposite of essence. Hypostasis refers to an individual thing. So again, here's our our two poles. We have essence, which refers to the universals, and we have hypostasis, which refers to the particulars. And we know in Orthodox theology that these words are used very frequently. In fact, they're used in formal theological definitions. Um, the definition of the Holy Trinity, which is one essence with three hypostases. Now, how do we get from a from the particulars to the universal? It's a mental process. Everybody agrees that there's a mental process going on somehow. No, People, the philosophers, don't agree on how that mental process works. But in the moderate realist tradition, it is called abstraction. Abstraction is the process by which we take a whole bunch of particulars and we abstract or take out from them the broader idea of the universal. So this gives us our basic introduction to the concept of universals, to nominalism, our particular topic, and the competing philosophies or the competing ideas regarding nominalism. So, God willing, tomorrow we will examine specifically what are the moral consequences of nominalism. We will also examine what is the orthodox view on universals to the extent that we are capable of articulating such a view and we will be able to come up with a broad understanding of how we should look at these philosophical topics so that we can both inform our views on the world and so that we can understand how we as Christians ought to act. So I thank all of you for attending this uh, this little talk. I apologize for the technical difficulties which which we've had. I hope that all of you were able to enjoy it. And God willing, tomorrow we will continue with the conclusion of our talk. To the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, and of God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Uh, thank you so much, Your Grace. And uh, again, a, a reminder, the continuation and conclusion of this lecture uh, will be held tomorrow at 5.30 Pacific Time and will be followed by a question and answer session. Um, and again, I, I do apologize for the technical difficulties and I thank everyone for their patience. Good night.